Thank you very much, and thank you for having me here. It's a, a great pleasure to be at this research conference and to be in Ireland for the first time in my life. And it's very good that the first time is for this topic and for this subject that um, really should unite us all. And it's, I, I always love hearing other countries' experiences, and especially the complaints, because we are all struggling with the same. We are all struggling, struggling with lack of resources. We're all struggling with lack of funding. Uh, but we are also all struggling with uh, a growing interest in having a more, more inclusive systems. Um, what I'm going to show you is uh, where we are, where we started from in Portugal, the recent changes we did in the law, very much inspired by New Brunswick. They were a bit our tutors, uh, even though they were not aware of it uh, many times. But uh, we did uh, a, a one initial part of our work was to know experiences from other countries, uh, because the problems are the same. The realities can be different. The groups that require uh, stronger attention in terms of inclusion can be different, but the principle is always the same, is whether or not we want a school for all, or whether or not we want a school for those who sometimes don't need school as much as the others uh, do. And I, I've just told this in an interview to the Irish Times, uh, we shouldn't be afraid of words. Inclusion, inclusive education is an ideological statement. And we have to assume this. We have to assume that we want this. Uh, and we, there's no room for compromise here. There's no inclusion but, as uh, Jody was saying. Uh, there's a commitment to inclusion or not. And, uh, and this is the commitment we are trying to, to, to establish uh, in Portugal with great difficulty, with lots of questions, lots of doubts, with very limited resources. We just came out of a huge financial crisis in Portugal with major cuts in the public services. And we are trying to rebuild uh, from there. So uh, as you'll see, you're not going to hear a, a fairy tale but uh, uh, the experience of a country with a history, with difficulties, and with the will to change the education system uh, to make it fully inclusive. Um, as I was, I was sitting there and I was, you know, thinking I'm going to be grateful for the invitation, of course, but then I had a very bad thought, uh, that, and I thought I shouldn't say this, but I will say it anyway. I think. The, the goal for you here in Ireland is that in the near future, you don't have a National Council for Special Education. You just have a National Council for Education, uh, because that's, that's when it means that full inclusion has been attained, and you are not separating departments or councils anymore. So, sorry for this. Uh, <laughs> so, the, the, the the outline of my presentation is this. I'll give you some information on where, where we are in Portugal, what's our, what are our uh, uh, biggest challenges right now. And I'm focusing this on grade repetition and retention of students. And uh, you'll see why. It's because one of the steps we are taking uh, pretty much in the same spirit as New Brunswick did was is to think of inclusion not only about uh, children with some kind of cognitive, physical, or learning impairment, but about all focus of exclusion. And when do we have exclusion in schools? When students are left behind, either because they, they drop out or because they don't progress with their, with their peers. Then I'll show you the ongoing measures that we took, the ongoing measures of political uh, um, the policy uh, decision. And I, I decided to focus the presentation on a comprehensive uh, view on what we are doing. Just to give you a bit the, the, uh, the spoiler of my own presentation, uh, what you'll see is that we did not just work on inclusive education, we did this on the side with a curriculum reform. And the, the, the principle is there's no point in talking about inclusion if the curriculum is not inclusive itself. Otherwise, we'll have this perfect curriculum for perfect students, for perfect schools, and then those who do not fit 
will be left out anyway. So we had to think, and we are still having to think, of a curriculum that is designed for everyone. Otherwise, there's no universal uh, learning design. And then I'll show you uh, the, how we built this policy, how we are monitoring this policy, and the difficulties and tensions that we, that we have uh, uh, right now. Um, just some background on where we are. Uh, we are a baby democracy. We, our democracy started in 74 with the famous Carnation Revolution. Uh, so a revolution with flowers, not with weapons. And uh, we were, after almost 50 years of uh, dictatorship, we were at a very bad stage in terms of education. And we achieved a lot. We're very proud of what we've done in only 40 years. And this is just some numbers that compare the census, uh, the national census in 61 and in 2016. So we had 0.9 preschool attendance and only in private institutions. Now we have, we have around 90% and a public network of uh, preschool from three to six. Uh, the transition rates to ISCAT 2 were 7.5%. Uh, in 2016, they were 87.2%, and now they are uh, above 90%. The high school enrollment in 61 was 1.3%. Now it's already reached 85% in 2019. The illiteracy levels, we had one quarter of the population that could not read and write, and now we basically eradicated uh, illiteracy from the country. This is a lot. This is much work done by schools, by teachers, by ministries, by uh, the civil society, by, by, by everyone. But we still have uh, challenges. Let me give you some uh, milestones of uh, our road for inclusion. This did, did not start with our government two years ago or because we approved a new law. We started long ago. So we started in the 60s, last century, and we moved from exclusion to segregation. Children with impairment uh, were at home. They didn't exist. They were invisible. Uh, so no one felt that this was a problem. In the worst case scenarios, you had some kind of uh, uh, social assistance for these families and for these children. In the, this was like this until, uh, until the 60s. And in the 60s, several special education schools, private schools, were built so these kids could move away from home and have some response, uh, educational response to them. In the late 90s, we started a, a movement with, with the legislation on this to bring this, these kids away from these special education schools and bring them to regular schools. This was consolidated in 2008 with a law that uh, actually provided a solution for the relation between regular schools and special education schools. We no longer wanted special education schools. So what did we do was we didn't close them, but we negotiated with them to make sure that we could count on their expertise. So what happens right now is that these institutions uh, have established themselves as resource centers for inclusion, and they work with school clusters, and they go to the school to provide speech and language therapy, uh, occupational therapy, behavioral te therapy, all kinds of services that are needed uh, for these children. And this was a good compromise solution uh, because we didn't disrupt uh, what existed, but we used uh, the expertise of these institutions to cooperate in this integration process. Uh, now, what's the step we're taking? The step we're taking is the most difficult one and probably the most ambitious. These kids are already in school for many years, but many times they were in segregated spaces inside the school, in segregated curricular spaces, and we had very low levels of attendance of the classrooms. They had special classes, they were in special groups. They came here and there to some of the classes, mostly physical education, arts, uh, but you know what people tend to think as the serious uh, subjects, they were not there. So uh, the law that we approved last year is basically a law that intends to take this step from integration to inclusion. And also a big difference is that it is no longer a law focusing on impairment, but it's focusing 
on all types of exclusion, pretty much like Kim showed. So, and, and, and this is why we also, uh, uh, it's very clear for me that uh, inclusion is never achieved. Full inclusion is never achieved because we can never predict which is going to be the focus of segregation that will appear in our community in the next 10 years. Right now, we have this migrant situation all over Europe. For some of us, this was a non-issue 20 years ago, or sometimes 10 or five years ago. So it's a new reality, so it's a new concern, and there will be no customized answer to any of the focus of uh, uh, segregation. Now, some of our major challenges. Grade repetition and early dropout are still very high in Portugal. Uh, we are doing a good journey. Uh, 20 years ago, we had above 50% of early school dropout. Now we are very close to 10% um, in 20 years. Um, but when we look at grade repetition and we think of uh, high school, for instance, almost one third of our students do not finish high school in due time, in the three year, years they were expected. So we are now uh, discussing this, and it actually became a very hot topic in Portugal in the last two weeks because in the new government we have a line in the program saying let's work on a plan to abolish grade repetition uh, in elementary school. So the, everyone is trying to figure out what this means and our opposition is telling us, ah, you want students who don't know anything to pass. And we say, no, we want students that know any, don't know anything to learn. And if they learn, then eventually they will pass. Uh, and that's the spirit of what you're doing. But this shows you, this debate, and it's a common debate also in other countries, shows you what are the conceptions about the mission of school. And that's, where, that's what I meant with saying that this is an ideological uh, problem. Is the mission of school to assess and certify, or is the mission of school to educate? And if you focus on the process of education, then eventually, hopefully, the results will be good. If you just focus on assessment and certification, you don't care about the process. And then you're just coming in the end to evaluate and see whether students achieved or not. It's all on the student, and it's not all on the community as a whole. Um, what happens in Portugal, like in other countries, we are concerned about great repetition and, and early dropout because for three reasons. First, it's very high. Uh, second, it's socially marked. The big predictor is the socioeconomic background of the families. So it doesn't, have, doesn't really have to do with the quality of teaching. It has more to do with the socioeconomic context. And that, so we have to, and I will come back to this, to readdress the issue of quality of teaching so that it accounts for the context uh, 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 as well. And also we know, and many studies show, it's pedagogical ineffective. That is, students who fail tend to fail again. So we could think, oh, this is a great measure because if a student repeats a whole year, he will become a good student. That's not what the evidence says. So we have to think of alternatives. And this is the problem is that many times Teachers tell us, yeah, but what, I, what is the alternative? And this was a bit the, the background for this uh, new law uh, that we approved. And for the measures that I'm going to, to, to show you, I will not go through all of them, otherwise we'd need a whole afternoon or more. But I want to give you a bit the panoramic view of what we did. The basic principle is that um, we have a good background to work on this. We have this magic number, 97.5% of children with uh, impairment are in regular schools now in Portugal, not fully included, but they are integrated there. So this gives us a good, a good background to, to, to work. Uh, we managed to get some consensus on, on, almost a generalized consensus on what the word all means, that we are not just talking about autistic or uh, blind or cognitive impaired. It means all. It means students from all kinds of minorities. Uh, it means students from the gypsy communities. It means, it means migrants. It means students with transient social uh, and emotional uh, problems. It means all. 
uh, and this was not this is not an easy consensus to reach because many times what you see I had a I engaged in a very hot debate in the summer because we we one of the groups that had segregation problems in Portugal it's a very very small group transgender children and so we approved a, a regulation on how schools should deal with these children. And I was attacked, as you cannot imagine, from the most conservative sectors of our society. And in many cases in discussions, discussion was like this. Yeah, gender equality is okay for the difference between men and women. That's okay. That far I go. In other cases it was, it's okay for different sexual orientations. That far I go. So, and many times it had to do with the self-experience of the person I was debating with. Uh, yeah, I have a son with a different sexual orientation, so it's okay. So at some point I was wishing these people to have all kinds of differences in their families so that they can be open to all kinds of diversity and uh, want the, the education system to respond to all. And this is, uh, this is always work uh, in progress. Another thing we, we, we did, and the, the, the background here is important, was that the law we had from 2008, which was a very important piece of legislation, was uh, established on the basis of a clinical model. So you needed the ICF to reference students to uh, decide which support they were going to have. This was important at that stage, but it didn't come without problems. What this created was a standardization of the support children were getting, and in many cases, over-diagnosis. And uh, one case, as you heard, I'm a linguist, so, and I worked on language development and language impairment in my real life before I got into this life. And uh, the one very obvious case is dyslexia. Uh, we have schools with around 20% of children with dyslexia. This is impossible. Either it's in the air and they breathe and they get dyslexic, or it's just impossible. And what this hides is real cases of dyslexia, other kinds of learning uh, uh, problems, and sometimes teaching problems. And, and the kids don't manage to learn, but they needed a label in order to get support. And this is something we remove, removed. You can still, of course, have a clinical diagnosis, but this is not a prerequisite to be uh, uh, assisted uh, in school. So, because... This is a complex problem. Uh, we wanted to have a structured response. I'm not sure you can read it, but I will just go very quickly through each of these circles. Uh, so we developed this national program for promoting school success, which had very uh, many different uh, uh, areas of intervention. Uh, they go from a new uh, a new, uh, a new set of pedagogical guidelines for preschool, and I like to mention preschool because it's an area, I'm not talking about the teachers, I'm talking about the three-year-olds. They don't care about segregation. They play with whoever, and, and, and they play together. So there's, there's real no problem for them. We should look more at how we were when we were three-year-olds, because we were sometimes easygoing, more easygoing than we are right now. Um, so uh, we worked on this. We developed a program for lifelong learning and adult education. Why? Because many times for some focus, of uh, uh, exclusion, bringing the parents back to school is a key factor to change the attitude of the families uh, towards, uh, uh, towards education. Uh, we made changes in the, uh, uh, in the evaluation model. We invested a lot in uh, 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 career development for, uh, for the teachers. We worked with the municipalities to have community approaches, but our focus, our biggest focus was the curriculum. And this is what I'm going through uh, quite uh, uh, more or less rapidly, so I have time to talk about the, the law on inclusive education. We started this work by uh, trying to answer a question. We, we talk about school success. 
a student's success all the time. But sometimes we forget to ask what is a successful student. And we indeed reduce this to a grade. And then we have the media doing school rankings based on the, on the, grade, on, on the grades on the exams, on the, the marks on the exams. And, and so we didn't want an answer saying a, a successful student is someone who has a mark A or B or C. We wanted to identify the principles, values, and areas of competence that the student should have by the end of compulsory schooling, which is uh, 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 grade 12 uh, in Portugal. So what you have there is the, is the areas of competence that all students have to develop now. And besides you know, the common things about literacy and so on, I'd like to draw your attention to some areas that involve uh, interpersonal relationship, individual and collective well-being, um, artistic sensitivity, problem solving, uh, critical thinking. These are key aspects to develop human beings who, when they are adults, will become uh, aware of the need to include everyone in the society. I will come back to this. Another thing we had to do, and this is still, as I will say in the end, an issue, uh, was to induce some changes in the evaluation model we have. Uh, the government before us, um, very much inspired by what is going on in the UK right now, uh, sorry, Peter, uh, um, designed a whole system of early exams. Fourth grade students had national exams, and then there were alternative paths. If you didn't perform well in the exams, you were sent as early as possible to vocational paths uh, so that you didn't spoil uh, the statistics. And we changed that. We, uh, what we're doing is we are trying to focus as much on formative assessment, on the diversification of assessment tools, and we are doing this also at the national scale. So now we have uh, uh, assessment tools in early years, but with a formative role to have an early detection of difficulties. Uh, we are making hybrid assessment tools, so you can be assessing language and sciences in the same, uh, in the same instrument. We introduce performative national scale assessments on physical education and arts. And this is an important message to show the schools that assessing is not only about uh, pen and paper. It's about many different types of expression. And an important aspect of this is that we do not give back marks. We give back to the families and the students in the school qualitative reports, descriptive reports on what each individual achieved. And this is, this is still making its way because it's much easier to get a mark. But, uh, you know, as, uh, as someone in Portugal used to say, uh, if I, uh, I limp, if I go to my doctor, I don't want him to look at me and say, B, right? I want him to say what I have, what I can do, what uh, if there was any progress, and where can I go from, from here? Um, why is this important for inclusion? Because if we don't do early detection of problems and specific problems, if in language, I'm not able to pin down that the problem with this student is not spelling, but it's inferences in reading. I cannot provide the assistance they need, this personalization and individualization that they need to attend to their specific needs. Another thing we do, this is very, very difficult. Uh, we have, like I think everyone has right now, a problem of curriculum overload. Uh, and we who come from the academia are the ones to blame because we want students to come to university and we don't have to teach because they already know everything. So wherever was the topic of my PhD thesis, I want the students to learn. And when we governments involve the academia, the outcome, I, I was involved in, in the curriculum for Portuguese many, many years ago for language. And you know, linguists and literature people were never in agreement. So we fought for six months and because we had to go on with our lives, we'd say, let's put everyone, everything in there and teachers will know how to deal with this. And then the poor teachers have to teach the whole thing and there is no time and inclusion requires time. 
So we started the process of curriculum downsizing. This is very, very difficult. We work with the professional societies, with teachers. Uh, we approached the curriculum for every, structure, for every subject with exactly the same structure, making links with the student profile. Uh, but it's very difficult because everyone agrees that there is a problem of curriculum overload. When you say, okay, let's cut here, then, you know, the, the world collapses because that's really important and no citizen can be happy if they haven't read that poem uh, from the 15th century. Uh, uh, and, and, and so we, are, we managed to do a lot, but we are still monitoring the outcome of this, of this work. Again, this is relevant because you cannot have inclusive classrooms if you have to impose a pace in learning to make sure that uh, you, you cover the whole curriculum, and then what happens is you speed up and speed up and speed up, and those students who have difficulties cannot follow up, and they will be left behind. Uh, another important instrument was in the, our curriculum reform, we uh, introduced more autonomy to the schools and curriculum flexibility. Curriculum flexibility does not mean uh, a local curriculum for each school, it means that you give schools the autonomy to merge subjects, to develop uh, uh, horizontal projects in the curriculum, to uh, uh, organize the groups in different ways, to uh, use different methodologies, to develop projects that have to do with the local community where, where they are. They are still learning mathematics and chemistry and history and geography, but they are doing this in more flexible ways. I'll give you a very specific example because I identified there, um, so uh, I identified there the, the role of arts, uh, uh, technology, citizenship. I didn't identify sports, but this is the example I'm going to give. Um, why are we focusing on some of these areas? We reintroduced citizenship education in the curriculum. One of the compulsory topics is human rights. And if students are not aware of the relevance and the importance of human rights, of the richness of multiculturality, they will never be uh, open for inclusion. Uh, but also we know that for many students, sports and arts are their first experience of success. It's the first time they hear in school, you're good. And for many students, this is their key motivation to be in school. And as a, as a, a professor who's been our advisor says, motivation is not part of the school material. So if you don't have motivation, you cannot tell a student, go home and bring the motivation because you forgot it. Um, so we have to find these areas and give the schools the freedom to develop the curriculum, focus on those areas that make the students want to be in school. Um, and, and, and so let me just give you an example from a, a, a school um, uh, we are working with. They, have, they are in a very, very difficult neighborhood in the city of Porto, very difficult. Boys are a big problem. They drop out of school. They don't want to be in school. The only subject that attracts them to school is physical education. And so what they did, they organized the curriculum more or less like this. One hour of language, one hour of physical education. One hour of mathematics, one hour of physical education. One hour of science, one hour of physical education. Result, they want to be in school and they are so tired that they do not create problems in the other classes, so they are much more focused. <laughs> uh, and this is, this is just because we let the school create and develop the curriculum in their own way. Uh, so this is also going on, a lot of fo big focus on project-based learning, also because of the, the, the uh, working on a project base uh, as this big, big advantage, which is we can have all students participate. I mean, I, I, was, I, was, I was looking at Jody being interviewed outside, and I was looking at the role of the journalist, the role of the cameraman, and they don't know how to do the same things, I assume but they are both needed. And, uh, and this is a way to make actual inclusive classrooms work, work in projects. And maybe that student who has some kind of impairment can perform a task 
in that project uh, that is not the same as the others, but he has a role and is valued and he will develop much more than if he's away uh, from his peers. And the others, and this is an important message for the parents of the others, the others develop much more because they do not only learn mathematics and chemistry and language, they learn about solidarity, they learn about interpersonal relationships, they become much more interesting human beings. And this is what school should be about, about creating interesting human beings. So now I finally come to the law on inclusive education. Uh, I already mentioned some parts of it. So the spirit is this step forward from integration to inclusion. I mentioned this departure from a clinical model, which also had resistance because you know that uh, special needs in some places are business. Some people work um, for referencing and diagnosing kids, and, uh, and we have to be aware of this. Uh, the, 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 the practical side of this law is a model, uh, a multi-level approach to inclusion uh, based on this universal learning design, and then we have three levels of application of measures. We have universal measures, those that, based on differentiation, that are true for every student uh, in any context. Uh, then we have what we call selective measures, those that require minor curricular adaptations, uh, these individualized plans, and then we have, on top of all, what we call the uh, additional measures. So, for students who have great impairment, great difficulties, and we have to find really very, very specific uh, solutions for them. Uh, another, another, another feature of this law is that we moved from a model in which the the, the student with difficulties was the responsibility of the special needs educator to a model in which this student is everyone's responsibility. So the assignment of these levels of measures is done by a multidisciplinary team uh, with a representative of the school principal, with the special education coordinator, with one of the teachers of the student, the parents can sit there, and other members of the community can be there uh, whenever, whenever required. Even the student has the right to sit there uh, if required, and this is an important uh, aspect. Uh, I can now browse quickly through the, the principles. I will not go into detail into this, but I'm sure we'll get the presentations afterward. But um, one important principle was what I just mentioned. The law presupposes that the, the whole school is an inclusive space. It's a space of inclusion. And this is one of the hard bits of the implementation, is that we are very much used to work in these uh, Balkanic uh, models. So here's the science club, and here's the inclusion club. And now the work is to integrate. What is the role of the science club for the inclusion of all students? What is the role of the school library for the inclusion of all students? Um, let me give you a very practical example. We launched with our national literacy plan this year one moment in every school in which students are invited to read for 10 minutes. And I was visiting a school in which they told me this was the best measure for inclusion because we managed to create some quietness that is very good to create an atmosphere in which everyone wants to participate. And we never thought of this 10 minutes reading as a measure for uh, implementing the law. So this is old school approach that is critical uh, uh, in, this, in our law. Uh, then we, we, we worked, and, and this, is, this is very important, uh, we could not do this if we didn't do the changes in the curriculum at the same time. Uh, otherwise, we would have a law with very good principles, but they would not be feasible because the curriculum didn't match them, or we'd have a very beautiful curriculum, but it wasn't sought for everyone. Uh, and, and this is an advice I would give you, is do not do this without looking into the curriculum and into the assessment uh, model you have. Um, so uh, I also mentioned this, that parents have the right to participate in the definition of, of measures. 
and we are working on a greater involvement of the parents. This is very, very important because um, when I hear about resources and lack of resources, I always say one thing. We all want more resources, starting with the government. Don't, don't, don't even question that because the one thing any minister or secretary of state does not want to hear in an event like this is, we need to, for that we need more resources, and then everyone claps, and then we don't have money in our pockets to give you more resources, and we feel very frustrated. So we were the first ones to want to tell our ministers of finances, please double our budget uh, so that we can give more resources. And we tend to prioritize the resources for inclusion. I think all governments right now are doing this. The budget for inclusion is much bigger in some cases than uh, other budgets. But my question is whether it is fair to say, for those students I work when I have the ideal conditions. And that's where parents are a very good example. The parents of these children are people who all of a sudden had a child with impairment. And they did not put them on a separate room for six months waiting to have all the conditions to educate them, to educate them. They started doing their best with the resources available. And this is also the challenge for us. Let's do our best with the resources available because it's not fair. It's about fairness that we're talking when we, we take uh, this kind of attitude. And with this, I'm not exempting myself or any government from uh, increasing the budget for inclusion. But what I'm saying is that it's not fair to have the richest budget to start working with the children that are emergencies for education. Um, final, finally, one important aspect also of the law is that all students with curriculum accommodations will have in the final three years of school an individual transition plan uh, adapted to what their life will be afterwards, either, either whether they are pursuing their studies or starting a career somewhere or being integrated in, uh, in some kind of job. And this is, we, we adopted this three-year calendar because you have to experiment several options for, with these kids and it, this, requires, this requires time. Okay, so how we did it and what our, our problems are apart from money. Money is always a problem. So we started, and I mentioned some of these aspects, but uh, the process took three years up to the approval of the law. So what we wanted to do was we asked every teacher in the country, we did a national survey on the curriculum and how much the curriculum enabled differentiation and inclusion. Uh, we created a working group for promoting hearings and they heard all stakeholders, students, parents, unions, societies, uh, the academia, teachers, everyone was heard in this working group. We had national conferences with professional societies. We organized seminars to discuss the project of the law all over the country. There were over 100 seminars in the country uh, open to everyone with open discussion no press so that we could say whatever we felt like without any barriers. Uh, we consulted parents. We launched the Student Voice Initiative that is now part of the curriculum as well. Uh, because many times we say things like, these kids don't want to be in school, but we never ask them why they don't want to be in school. Uh, and we got very rich information from, from this Student Voice initiative, and now all schools are invited to have regular instances for hearing students uh, uh, in the school. Um, then we did the, the essential curriculum, and we piloted. This, is what, this was very important. We piloted this with volunteering schools. We had one year pilot with, uh, with evaluation and reviews so that we could see what was fantasy in the mind of the legislator or things that could actually happen in schools. Now, right now we have a law approved and this is just the, the, the zero step because things don't happen, inclusion doesn't happen because there is a law, <laughs> it happens because things change in practice. So in terms of, of the, the process of man monitoring, we are investing a lot on a proximity follow-up. So we did local and regional teams to work together with the schools, to create networks of schools, to visit schools, to provide technical backup. Uh, we are also regularly collecting practices 
of schools, of their curricular options, of their approaches to inclusion, and we are sharing these practices. It's much, it's very effective this, because all of a sudden it's not the politician who's going, to there and, going there and say, look, inclusion is very good. No, it's a school with the same difficulties, the same type of teachers, the same uh, infrastructural problems that show we are doing this. So they are showing it is possible. And in the world of impossibles, it is possible in some places. And then there is a contamination, and there's even an idea sharing, because sometimes we just don't know what to do. And when we hear someone else presenting a good idea, we know what to do. Time is up, but I will use another three minutes. Uh, am I allowed? Okay. <laughs> Um, then we are investing also a lot on teacher training. On leadership training, we identified that the big difference between inclusive schools and non-inclusive schools have to do with the leader, the school principal. So, and this is, uh, you don't change mindsets, but you can train people to uh, organize the school in a more or less inclusive manner. We are having lots of national conferences and seminars. We did uh, an internal assessment of the pilot with a university, and now we have uh, uh, hired, contracted uh, uh, external reviews by OECD, the European uh, Commission, the European Agency, so that we have people from the outside giving it, providing us uh, advice. Some three important aspects that I'd like to emphasize. We, uh, and this has come up in the questions many times, we also have our media producing school rankings. I hate them. I don't have any respect for these school rankings. They don't tell you anything about the quality of schools. So what we did was to approve a new framework for school quality assessment, and inclusion is as important in this new framework as the results of the marks of the students. So in a way, when we're asking how good is your school, we are actually asking how inclusive is your school. And, and this, is, this is a very important signal that the ministry uh, gives to schools. Uh, uh, there's no point in having this elite in the school that uh, would have these good grades, good marks, wherever they were, uh, and this does not really reflect the school. It reflects the family, the ability to pay for private lessons, for private tuition. Uh, and so we are creating a set of indicators that uh, uh, allow to measure progress rather than absolute values in, at the end of the, of the school cycle. Uh, we are uh, having this, as I mentioned, inclusive approach to inclusion. So it's really about all, so we are developing programs uh, for uh, gypsy minorities, for migrants, and to try to identify all focus uh, uh, of exclusion. And it's very critical, and I really, if I can give some advice, to promote student voice and to promote human rights education is critical. Otherwise, you know, the kid with difficulty is the one day uh, we, it's the day for autism, and we're all very concerned about autism, but then in everyday life, no one cares about this anymore. Final, finally, some tensions, dilemmas, difficulties, and how we are or are not responding to them. Assessment is an issue. Uh, people agree with the principles, but then, uh, you know, there's these polls, there's inclusion and standardization, and they are different worlds. Even inside the ministry, we, it's, a very, it's very difficult to make people work on standardized assessment, talk with the teams working, with the official officers working on inclusion. So we are trying to uh, uh, promote more in-depth evaluation of the results of exams, trained formative assessment, and also we published last year an adaptation guide for national exams that basically try to uh, bring together the way students learn with the way uh, students are assessed. Uh, there's a matter of public perception of the purpose of school, uh, and this has to do with the school rankings. Luckily, we are getting good media coverage. And, and part of it is, if I can give uh, a piece of advice to politicians here, when they want to do interviews with us, what I did all the time was, don't talk to me, go visit this school. And, and then the politician is not there, and it's the actual school uh, showing how it can be different. We have a problem with access to university. 
uh, and we are not yet doing anything about it. And uh, so uh, it's much easier to work on inclusion up to grade nine than in high school, because high school is a preparation field for the exams to access university. So inclusion is being more difficult in these final years, and this is a matter of concern for us. But uh, it's very difficult to, to do anything here. Uh, we have a very, I, I, I told you with this uh, volcanic image, uh, uh, we have this compartmentation in schools. This is the department of language, this is the department of this, this is the department of that. So we are taking examples from uh, many ways of working in a project, transdisciplinary project. We have a problem with our teaching body, a problem of age which we are not solving to, to the discontent of all teachers because we cannot, we don't have the money to lower the retirement age. And the other things I mentioned, one, one important aspect is bureaucracy. The law created bureaucracy, and this is something I hate because this was not the purpose. So we are now trying to address this, how to remove uh, paper. So final words, uh, this is work in progress because uh, inclusion is work in progress. Uh, whenever I hear someone saying in Portugal, we already implemented the law, I respond back, I'm sure you didn't. Uh, and uh, which is sad because they were so happy telling me that they implemented the law. It's very important to have this constant follow-up. No one can be felt alone. This, this works in collaboration and networking because no one has the magical answer for what inclusion uh, is, uh, uh, is about. Uh, there are there's an important thing that we did in our law. We deleted the word homogeneous. You don't find it anywhere. The concept of homogeneous classes that existed in our legislation was deleted. I always use this image. I'm short-sighted. If I take out my glasses, you all become homogeneous. But I don't see you. And education is about seeing people. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>